Mars and its Canals by Percival Lowell. Chapter 19. Canals in the Dark Regions. Seventeen years after the recognition of the canals in the light regions, occurred another important event, the discovery of a similar set in the dark ones. The detection of these markings in the dark areas was a more difficult feat than the perceiving of those in the light, and in consequence was later accomplished. Also, it was one where recognition came by degrees. I have previously pointed out what this discovery did for the seas, nothing less than the taking away of their character in a generally convincing manner. To one who had carefully considered the matter, the seas had indeed already lost it, as was shown in Chapter 10, but to those who had not, these canals presented a very instant proof of the fact. From such not wholly supererogatory service, they went on to furnish unlooked-for help in other directions. Their discovery showed in the first place that no part of the planet's surface was free from canal triangulation. But it did more than this, for these canals in the dark regions left the edge of the continents at the very points where the canals of the light regions entered them, which in fact proved for them a community of interest with the latter. Such continuation was highly significant, since it linked the two together into a single system, compassing the whole surface of the planet, starting from the places where the light region canals come out upon the great girdle of seas that stretches all round the planet, most of the new canals headed toward the passes between the islands south, as nearly poleward as circumstances of local topography would permit. In the broader expanses of the Sirtis Major and the Merovithium, besides main arteries, others went to spots in their midst after the same fashion as those in the light regions. These spots differed in no way, apparently, from their fellow oases elsewhere. From a spot in the center of Sirtis, three great lines thus traveled south. The Dosaran, heading straight up the Sirtis on the meridian till it struck the northernmost point of Hellas. The Orsonines, inclined more to the right, passing through the dark channel to the west of that land, and so proceeding south. And lastly the Erymanthus, turning eastward till it brought up finally at the Hesperidum Lucus, where, on the other hand, the long chain of lighter land, called the Chapelle Islands, and stretching from the Solus Lacus region westward to Hellas, offered only here and there an exit, the canals made for these exits. The canals in the Mare Serenum, the Mare Sumerian, and the Mare Tyranum struck more or less diagonally across those seas from their northern termini to the entrances of the straits between the islands, thus lacing the seas in the way a sail is rolled to its spar. From the exact manner in which they connected with the light region canals, they proved the two to be part and parcel of one system, which in its extension was planet-wide, and therefore proportionally important. Whatever of strange interest the curious characteristics of the canals themselves suggested was now greatly increased by this addition, for the solidarity of the phenomena affected the cogency of any argument derived from it. In 1894, only the dark areas of the southern hemisphere were found to be thus laced with lines. For then, so great was the tilt of the planet's south pole toward the earth, that while those zones were well displayed, the dark patches of the northern hemisphere were more or less hauled down over the disk's northern horizon. Contrast was the open sesame to their detection. Where the maria showed dark, the lines are lost in the somberness of the background. As the maria lighten, the lines come out. Such was amply witnessed by the effect in 1894 and 1896. In 1894 I found it impossible to perceive them, except where the Pardargas crossed Atlantis for the hue of the maria themselves was then very dark. In 1896, on the other hand, I saw them without difficulty. What is also of interest, so soon as seen, they appeared small, without haziness or distension. As the opposition succeeded one another, the northern regions rose into view, and with their appearance came the detection of them in the same phenomena. No large dark areas like the diaphragm exist there, but the smaller patches of blue-green which bestrew them proved to be similarly meshed. At first, canals were evident upon their peripheries, contouring them about, then the bodies themselves of the patches showed gridironed by lines. The Mare Acidalium, with its adjuncts, the Lucas Niliacus on the south, and the Lacus Hapoboreus on the north, thus stood out in 1901. On a particularly good evening of definition at the end of May, the Mare suddenly made background for a burst of dark rays, six of them in all, radiating from a point between it and the Lacus Hyperboreus. Considering how somber the mare was at the time, this was as remarkable a vision as it was striking to see. Although at the moment the sight, 
was of the nature of a revelation, these lines have been amply verified since, as the Martian season has proved more propitious. Similar decipherment has befallen all the other patches of blue-green in the northern hemisphere, these having shown themselves first circumscribed and then traversed by canals. Interesting instances were the Wedge of Cassius and the Propontis. These markings, first perceived years ago as mere patches of shading, then partially resolved by Scaparelli, now stood revealed as a perfect network of lines and spots. So many of both kinds of their detail occupied the ground that to identify them all was matter of exceeding difficulty. The outcome is shown in the diagrammatic representations opposite and on page 256. These drawings disclose better than any description the massive detail of which the patches are in reality composed, and serve to convey an idea of the complexity involved. If the general canal system seems intricate, here is something which exceeds that as much again. The extension in this manner of the curious triangulation of the light areas, into and through all the dark areas as well, by thus spreading the field of its operations over both terrains, complexion to so unalike, greatly increases the cogency of the deduction that this detail is of later origin than the background upon which it rests, that the mesh of lines covers not only the ochre stretches of the disk, but the blue-green parts as well, makes it still more certain that it is not a simple physical outcome of the fundamental forces that featured the planet's face. For in that case, it could not, with such absolute impartiality, involve both alike. Thus here, again, we find corroboration by later observations of what earlier ones established. The last link in the chain of canal sequences remains to be recorded. Just as the lines in the dark regions continued those in the light, so they themselves turned out to be similarly prolonged, and in no less suggestive a manner. For when the northern polar zone came to be displayed, canals were evident there, continuing those in the other zones, and running, at their northern ends, into dark spots at the edge of the polar cap. Here, then, we have the end of the whole system, or more properly its origin in the polar snows. The significance of this will be seen from other phenomena, to a consideration of which we now proceed. End of chapter 19. Recording by Todd.